watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Like and subscribe for more. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Katie. Welcome to my house in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Let's go on in. Hi, my name is Katie Rosenfeld. I'm an interior designer in Boston, Mass, and you're in my house. I would describe my house as very super personal, very um, warm and cozy and livable and real, layered. I think it's really representative of who I am as a person and also as a designer. Um, and every, almost every one of my clients I bring here or we use pictures of my house as references when they're scared to let me sort of layer things. All right, so this house, I think the whole essence of this house is that it's a Tudor. It has arches, it's got um, pl messy plaster walls, um, it has all kinds of Gothic references, and I wanted to really play on that. So um, my foyer is little itty bitty, but when you walk in the house, there's um, some old reclaimed terracotta tiles that would be very indigenous to a Gothic house or a house um, of the Tudor uh, persuasion, shall we say. And there's a cute little built-in bench that is original to the house that I had upholstered in like what I would call a Jacobean tapestry. I was going for like real literal Tudor, um, but I made it a little funny. And how I did that was I put some quirky art in funny places so that all the seriousness was lightened up a little bit. I could have had a coat closet, um, and I essentially don't have a foyer. I mean, it's really just sort of almost like an arrival. It's not a, it's not a grand foyer. It's kind of tiny, but um, I could have built a coat closet, but it would have meant losing a window in my living room, which I wasn't willing to do. So I have three ways of handling coats. One is that I throw them on a chair. That's one way. Um, the second way is that I hang them on one of these um, really pretty um, bent wood hooks that I bought from Austria that are so fragile that nothing should be hung on them. So that's another place um, where I hang coats. Um, I, we throw them on this bench. I really just don't get too hung up on it. Um, and also the fact of the matter is we've only lived here for a year and a half and most of it was COVID. So talk to me in a year and we'll see what the coat closet lack of coat closet brings. I would say that I am sort of typical of the self-taught decorator model. Um, I did not go to school for interior design. In fact, I started my career, started on Wall Street when I was super young and um, I was in recruiting, kind of a people person, right? So that can be sort of folded into all kinds of careers. And I really had, I majored in philosophy and art history no idea what I wanted to do and no practical application. I really landed on this accidentally. Long story short, um, I worked on Wall Street, was very unhappy, decided I want to leave. Um, I left when I got married. My husband afforded me the possibility of, you know, making a career change and I started selling art. Um, and I was using my home as kind of a gallery salon kind of a situation. And people would come in and they would buy art. I would have these parties with you know, 100, 150 people. They would buy art and then they would email me or call me the next day and say, you know what? I really loved your kitchen. Can you help me renovate my kitchen? And this kind of thing started happening. So it just literally morphed into an interior design business with just me writing orders on a piece of paper and sort of phoning them in. And now I have like a legitimate practice with multiple employees and projects all over the country. Um, I mean, it really is a career that happened like a happy accident. So now we're gonna go into, I guess what you would call the living room, but it's actually three different distinct spaces that combine to form my living room, come on. So this is my living room. Um, it's actually three distinct spaces that combine um, to form one great big sort of modified open plan living room. I think that what 
originally this was, um, I feel like this little area over here was possibly a seating gathering area. And I think the fireplace, which is across on the other side of the room, was where people sat to get warm. And then in um, the room behind, it was a garden room. I, I know this because, um, and I'll show you, um, when we were renovating the house, number one, the floor is tile. Um, it's clinker tile, which is like a really old fashioned kind of cheap brick. Um, and I also found a hose in the wall. Um, which leads me to believe that they did potting in here. And I kept it because I just thought it was super funny and I knew the drapes would cover it. Um, and I almost didn't want to forget that there was a hose in my wall. So um, I think this used to be like a potting shed, sunroom. Now it's an office slash seating area. Um, over to the left, I actually have a comfy seating area with a great big TV. And it's the first time I've ever had a TV in my living room and I love it. Um, I'm sure I'll get criticized for this because it's not like standard operating procedure to have a TV in your living room. But because of the amount of TV that my family watches, I will put a TV anywhere a TV can go. So we do have one on the wall and it's actually not ugly to look at. I mean, it's not like the prettiest thing on earth, but it's also, it, it's one of those frame TVs. It was a very easy decision for me to change careers from something that made me like deeply stressed and unhappy to something that made me feel like alive and inspired and all of that stuff. Um, forgetting about the financial aspect of it, of course, but I think the hard part is just when you're doing something creative, you're really putting yourself out there for people to look at and to criticize. So it's really hard. I think the hardest part for anybody in a creative industry is finding just like their sea legs and their confidence and being comfortable putting what they have to offer out there in the world, especially with all this technology, for people to um, dissect and copy and criticize and you know screw up on certain occasions and all that kind of like noise that happens surrounding it is the hard part but um, I think it all stems from confidence and that's something in my 50s I'm literally I think right hitting that stride right now as a younger designer I was like you know I was a whirling dervish it was a mess in this zone is like the relaxation zone. Um, I wanted it to feel like grandma's house had been revived. Um, that's why I did kind of a wild pattern on the sofa, um, which you're seeing a lot of right now. It's like coming back, but I've always been kind of a granny decorator at heart and a real traditionalist. So this is something I would have done many years ago and I'm still doing it. Um, so the sofa has this large scale pattern and basically what I tried to do in this house, believe it or not, was my main focus was I didn't want anything to match. So I wanted it to feel as though it had evolved and grown and mishmashed together. That's why the rug doesn't reference the colors and the pillows and the colors and the pil pillows don't reference the colors in the other rug and so on and so forth. So in a sense, this room is like, I think my, dec my biggest decorating sort of fun thing to do, which is to put um, disparate objects together and make them work together, even though they wouldn't in isolation, if that makes any sense. Um, a good example of that, I think, is the fact that the rug is pink and light sage green and blue. And then I've got pillows on this sofa in like a deep purple with gold and turquoise. And I've got these crazy um, embroidered pillows that have red and green and turquoise. So, you know, you really, if you look at each element, it really doesn't necessarily match the other elements, but somehow once they're all together, they really work. And it's little teeny things for me, like basically the cover of this book is the same color as the orange in this pillow. 
And that's the kind of connections I like to make in rooms, like little sort of um, very discreet connections. Um, and that's when the decorating, I think, looks the best to me. So we bought this house um, during the very, very height of the pandemic, like during the time where people were like Lysoling their groceries and wearing gloves and like ski masks when they went outside. That, that was when we bought this house. No one came to see it, which is why we got it so quickly. I mean, it was really like serendipitous timing. Um, but it's a 1926 Tudor that really hadn't been touched. There had been some modifications to the kitchen and the bathrooms. I'm gonna say in the 80s, um, it reeked of 80s. Uh, the kitchen looked like the Olive Garden. Um, but other than that, it had really hadn't been touched since, since it had been built. And we embarked on a full scale, like mainly cosmetic, but somewhat surgical renovation of the house during the real height of the lockdown, which was super challenging, but also kind of exciting at the same time. These are lollipops. Um, we're big candy eaters, and this is like a half empty um, jelly bean mix. All the good ones have been eaten out um, at Thanksgiving, but we're big candy eaters, so I always have candy out. I have a lot of collections. That's something that I, I got from my mom. I mean, she's sort of a hoarder and, and collects a lot of things, as do I. Um, and here, I have a lot of toll. Um, toll is like this metal, um, it's like a metal material that's been painted over. And you can see here, this is like an old toll tray. Um, but I collect toll and um, plates, trays, platters, whatever. So I've got one here, I've got one here. Um, I've got a bunch in my kitchen. Um, so I love to collect things and toll, uh, this is toll actually, um, it's a jar. Um, the other thing I like to collect is needlepoint and I like old vintage needlepoint. So here's a pillow that I bought on First Dibs or Cherish or one of those sites. Um, there's another one over here that also is vintage needlepoint, has butterflies on it. But these are the kinds of things that I like to throw into my designs that um, don't necessarily make sense until they are placed in the room. Um, and I love that it feels collected. This, for example, is my grandpa's chair. It's Danish modern, and it's been in every house that I've ever had. Um, and these guys are old vintage. I do a lot of vintage mixed with new, but a lot of the things that are my favorite things are things that I've had forever or that I've collected over time. So like these lacquer James Mont vintage chairs were something I bought early on when I was really into chinoiserie. This campaign style table, I love campaign style anything. Um, this was on a tag sale at the Baker showroom when I was just starting out decorating and um, I could afford it, so I grabbed it. It's been in seven houses. This desk I found at consignment, it's actually a partner's desk, which means it's double wide. Um, so theoretically it was made for two people to work at um, and it's just huge and I thought it was so cool. Again, it has a lot of these like kind of chinoiserie accents um, that work so well with any style. So I've had this forever. This is my husband's grandmother's desk chair. Um, you know, a lot of this is just stuff that I love that I throw together. Um, but there's also some new things. Um, this bench is new um, over here by the window. Um, and I had it made just for this space. Um, so that's new. And a lot of the upholstery and the like TV area is new. Um, but the, the, the most fun thing for me to do when I'm decorating is to mix things that I already have with other things that I find along the way and new things. That's my favorite thing to do. So, I mean, I'm not the kind of gal that's gonna stand on a soapbox and talk about historic preservation and the environment and preserving this and that and the other. I just don't think I have a platform to tell other people how they should behave. But in my case, when I see an old house with a lot of architectural integrity, 
it makes me super sad when someone wants to break it apart or knock it down and sort of lose the bones and lose the, the authenticity and the integrity of the house. Um, you know, I can't judge someone. People do it all the time, but I think it's really important um, for me personally to have a house that has some history and that has some quirks and it kind of fascinates me to think people lived here before and what did they do in the in the space that I'm sitting in. Um, I'm just not one of those people who loves everything perfect and new. So um, renovating to me is much more appealing than building from the ground up. But there's tons of clients I have that could say the exact opposite. So the fireplace area is actually, is one of my favorite aspects of the house. Um, there was a lot of talk at the beginning of the project about redoing the fireplace. It's not exactly the most gorgeous thing you've ever seen. The stone is kind of like got a little bit of a rusty patina to it. And it's, it's very tutorial, very Game of Thrones. Um, and I could have refaced it and done it over in millwork, but something told me to leave it. And I did, and I'm really glad that I did. Um, I found these two like almost throne like chairs at consignment and they felt perfect for in front of this particular fireplace. And then mounted above it is a deer that one of my clients gifted to me. Again, this being a tutor and the whole English thing and the sort of Cotswoldy theme, I just thought it was kind of like perfect to have a piece of taxidermy over my fireplace, even though um, I myself do not hunt um, and did not hunt that deer. I love him, his name is Big Papa, and he was gifted from one of my very favorite clients. So one crazy thing um, that I really love that happened during my renovation was one of my Instagram followers um, was following the documentation of my renovation. And she somehow noticed in the details of the architecture of my house that it looked a lot like her husband's grandmother's original house. She lives in New Jersey. She had no idea where the house was. She thought it was in Massachusetts, which it is. But she reached out to me and said, you know, is this house in Wellesley, Massachusetts? And I said, yes, it is. And she said, I think this is my husband's grandma's house that she built in the 20s. And I said, really? Can you, you know, we started a dialogue and she sent me all these original pictures of the house when it was first built and the family that moved in. And it's just an awesome story. Um, they had two little girls. Um, I think the grandma was called Bubby or Bubs, Bubs. That was the grandmother. Um, and I've got all these photographs of the first people who built this house sitting in this room with this fireplace, um, which is awesome. The one thing I think I should bring up before we leave this room, and it really kind of carries throughout my whole house, is that forever and ever and ever, I've collected art. Um, not necessarily important investment grade art, but things that I find in various places that I love. Things that I bought on the internet, things I found on the side of the road and had reframed, things I bought from artists that I saw and could afford. Um, you know, it's not like I go to a gallery and go shopping for art. All of this stuff is hodgepodge. And a lot of it, quite honestly, the frame costs more than the piece of art, but to me, that's the best kind of collection of art to build is to have vintage mixed with new. So I've got some abstract pieces, um, like over here, for example, is a good example. I have some abstract pieces from an artist that I know in New Jersey um, mixed with um, an old family portrait of someone, I can't read his name, but I bought this in Connecticut. And it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. And I have no idea who he is, but I do love collecting pictures of people I don't know. Um, so I love the foil of the really ornate frame and the portrait juxtaposed with the clean, abstract, modern pieces on the adjacent wall. Let's go in the kitchen. Um, so this room, I think, is probably, this. This has gotta be my favorite room. Um, and it's the room that required the most effort and the most attention and the room that I really, really, really wanted to get right when I renovated this house. Um, it's a tiny kitchen. It's not big at all. 
Um, and the one thing that's unusual about this kitchen in the United States is that it's based on a European style. Um, and what that means is that the cabinets in back in the day in Europe, when you had an apartment or a flat, you would have kitchen cabinetry that was just kind of affixed to the wall. And when you moved, you would take it with you. So the concept is that your cabinetry was unfitted. Um, now, in modern times, a lot of kitchens you'll see are cabinets that go all the way to the crown of um, the ceiling and are really built around an entire room, completely built in, not at all something you could take with you. I wanted this kitchen to feel like it was back in the day. So if you'll notice, a lot of the pieces are mismatched heights um, and there are sort of, there's a ton of asymmetry, which I happen to love. Um, and that's what I chose to do in here. Um, a really good example of that, again, is this kind of stovetop run where I chose to put this little sink in here, um, which sacrificed counter space, but I really like the way this looked. <laughs> so I put it in, um, and of course I needed to have a sconce and a shelf above it. Um, but in all seriousness, like if you look at the visual lines here, you've got this shelf, then you've got this short run of cabinetry, you've got the mantle, which doesn't connect to anything, um, and then you've got this larder, which is where I keep all of my food, believe it or not. And I can show you inside. It's a little bit of a mess, but it's really hard working and, you know, tons and tons of snacks and stuff like that. But what it, what it basically is all about for me is kind of forcing myself to live in a restrained way. So I don't have storage for storage's sake. I don't have empty cabinets. All my cabinets are filled um, and I'm okay with that. The other thing to point out, which again is quirky, but I really love this area. I had to decide if it was going to be an eat-in kitchen um, and I could have turned this area into a great big table and maybe a serving piece. I could have even wrapped the cabinetry around, but I really love TV. I've kind of already said that. So I wanted to be able to watch TV while I was in the kitchen and kind of scoot over here and watch TV while things were cooking. So I chose to make this a sitting room instead of an eat-in kitchen. Um, so the area adjacent, sort of the L, L of the kitchen is this cozy little couch area with a TV and um, a storage piece and some funky art and plants and you know all that kind of thing and so while dinner is cooking um, people are hanging out here and it's super fun I mean if we want to we can eat at the coffee table but most nights we eat at the um, I call it the work table because it's not really a kitchen island um, it's elevated on legs um, and it doesn't have a sink in it. So um, there's storage on one side of it, which is this side, and a lot of storage for deep pots and pans. But the other side is really um, kind of a counter height table. So the four, my family of four sits here every night for dinner. So three on this side, one on the other, right here. My favorite thing about this house, gosh, that's a super hard question. Um, I don't know if I could pick a favorite thing. I think the fact that this actually happened to me and I got to live here is my favorite thing, as corny as that sounds. Um, I feel like it was really meant to be and um, the universe really drew me to this crazy house. I typically am not attracted to tutors and this is heavy, heavy tutor. Um, I just fell in love with it the minute I saw it and it I feel like it saved my family. So um, that's kind of, I see it as like my fortress because of that. So I know that sounds super like corny and you know, gooey ooey, but it's really kind of the truth. So this is my dining room. Um, it's right off the kitchen, um, as you can see, which is an ideal location and this is where it was originally. This room was so dark and so depressing and like such a Debbie Downer when I moved into the house. All of the woodwork in my entire house 
um, including these cabinets and all this wainscoting was natural oak. So it just had a really heavy, dark feel and I chose to paint all of it. Um, and I knew I was gonna do that and I knew that that's also something that's controversial, I think, in tutors. Um, but, you know, I did it and I love it. Um, the dining room, again, is kind of petite. Um, it's really a four to six seater dining table um, and we do eat a lot of meals here too. One thing to the point I was making about the eat-in kitchen, I have this new philosophy that I don't want rooms that don't get used. And in my old house, we only sat in the dining room for holidays or parties or that kind of thing. I am addicted to pattern and that's clear um, in my decorating. And a very old school way of dressing a lamp is to make a custom lampshade that's a pattern. And so a lot of the lighting in my house has these pattern lampshades. They're really nostalgic. They're kind of kooky and crazy. Again, something you might see more over in Europe than you would see here. Um, but I just feel like it gives the lamp a lot of character and almost turns it into like a piece of art as opposed to just having a plain white shade. So um, you'll notice even in my living room and throughout when we go to my bedroom, you'll see I've done a lot of custom pattern lampshades. I think it's so subjective, right? Like the fact of the matter is there are some people that would look at this situation and say, this wallpaper is like paper bag brown. It's got a teeny bit of purple and green and maybe some terracotta in it. What on earth made you put a turquoise lamp with a brown lampshade with it? Well, I think that's the whole point is that I, it would have been really easy to put something green there or brown there that matched, but I really wanted to throw everything off. That's why I chose the blue because there's no blue in this room other than in the rug. Um, and again, hearkening back to that whole thing that thrills me about decorating, which is the purposeful non-matching of things. Um, that is how I did it. I mean, I just didn't put a lot, I kind of did the opposite of what intuition would do, if that makes any sense. I took what would match and then thought, well, what wouldn't match? <laughs> That's how I chose it. One of the main um, big decisions we had when we were renovating this house was what to do with the woodwork. Um, all of the woodwork throughout the house, all the beams, all the trim, all the window casings were this kind of chestnutty colored oak and very tutorial, but very dark. I chose to paint most of the woodwork, but um, the one thing that I decided to leave was the staircase. I wanted the banister and the stair rails to feel and, and to be authentic to the house. And I'm really glad that I did that. I chose to paint the risers um, the same color as my off-white trim throughout to lighten it up just a little bit. But we have like kind of a grand staircase and this is really what sold me on the house in the first place. So it was super important to me that I get this stair thing right. Come on up, I'll show you. So you walk up and you sort of hit this Juliet balcony situation. And I knew that I wanted to drape these windows. Um, I just feel like it's so cozy and so sort of, again, there's just this nostalgic feeling I get every morning when I wake up and come down and see this like really pretty big old balcony window with drapes on it. Um, so walking down the approach uh, to and from this window is actually probably my favorite architectural aspect of the house. And then when you walk up, the stairway has a lot of quirk to it. Um, there's this really strange situation, which I think used to be like some sort of roping off for the public, I don't know. But again, I left it because it's just so odd and so funny. Um, but the staircase has this really graceful kind of unusual, um, kind of an S turn at the top, which you really don't see a lot. And it's just really romantic and pretty. So I love it. So right off the stairs is my bedroom. Come on in. So as you can see, um, this bedroom is kind of chock full of one print. 
this is um, a really kind of aggressive way of decorating and it's not for the faint of heart, but I knew when I saw this house that my room needed to be draped in flowers. Um, that being said, I didn't want it to be super colorful, which is why I kind of ironically chose a floral print that is neutral. Go figure. Um, but that's what it is. And I basically camouflaged the whole room um, in this print. So the bench is covered in the fabric. The walls have the w matching wallpaper. My lampshades match. My pillows match. I wanted to do the bed and the drapes. My husband drew the line and said, enough. Um, eventually I will do them, um, but for now, um, just white. The room is really dreamy. Um, when you're in here at night, you really feel, I feel like I'm in like an English garden and I feel really cocooned and protected and it's just, it's my special place, uh, my Zen den. Um, bed in front of the window. This wasn't really an option with the layout of the room and it's not ideal, but as you can see, I have drapes behind my bed and I floated the bed just a bit proud of the drapes. Um, and it's really not that big of a deal. This is the kind of thing a client would ruminate over, um, but it, it's fine, right? Um, and I've got two nightstands and another view, lovely view out this window where my shade is broken and I can't show it to you because it won't go up. But if it did go up, you'd see something pretty. This is the bathroom. This is like sort of ground zero, I think, for my house for so many reasons. Number one, I think it's the first room I actually saw in my head. I knew I wanted this wallpaper. I knew I wanted really dark, um, old-fashioned hexagon tiles, so I chose this really dark gray marble. Um, and I knew I wanted my bathroom vanity to feel like a chest. And um, that is actually a whole other story, but um, fast forward, I'm now launching a line of vanities that um, are inspired by old chests. If you look at it, it's literally like a piece of furniture. Um, instead of being cabinetry, I chose to have all of the van bath vanities in my house be freestanding. So if you'll notice, it doesn't go wall to wall, just kind of like my kitchen. Same concept, unfitted. I wanted it to feel like a piece of furniture rather than cabinetry. So um, that was the intent here. And, you know, it's, it's specific. You have to like embrace the imperfection of it all. And the fact that you're losing, you know, three inches of storage here and four inches of storage there. But for me, the aesthetic part of it was more important. And to add these details, like the trunk handle and that sort of thing um, were the fun part. I also have wooden toilet seats in all my bathrooms, which I really love. People who know me know that, and I think you can probably tell just from me talking, I'm hardly shy or introverted, right? I, I'm comfortable speaking and I'm fairly extroverted, but you wouldn't believe what a homebody I am. I actually spend almost all my free time at home. It's like kind of pathological. So home to me is everything. I live in every room, I move around the house, I watch a lot of TV. We have TVs everywhere. I'm a big believer in making your house, adapting the house to your lifestyle while having it be compelling to look at and interesting and layered and beautiful. But the most important thing to me is being super comfortable and shutting the door and shutting the rest of the world out. Thanks for watching. For more homeworthy content, be sure to like and subscribe.